I want to move now to a colleague of mine from Copyright Clearance Center as well, um, Drew Zaretti. Um, Drew, by the way, is coming to us uh, straight from Anchorage, where she just participated in the Mayor's Midnight Sun Marathon. And uh, so we're really happy to have her here, uh, perhaps a bit tired, but all the same, uh, welcome Drew. Um, Drew travels extensively throughout the United States on educational visits to colleges and university campuses. And um, she's presented seminars on copyright issues for a variety of national conferences, including the National Association of College Stores, uh, the Medical Library Association Annual Conference, and the Special Library Association Annual Conference as well. Um, Drew, what I, I wanted to do was to sort of start thinking about the, the published work and, and to, um, again, always keep in mind that we do live in this digital age and, and, and sort of put in perspective first for people um, how important copyright has become today uh, for creators, authors of all kinds. Give us a, a, a brief sketch of that, that IP world. Intellectual products are actually the primary fuel of the U.S. economy. Many people don't realize that, that in fact, IP accounts for more than $433 billion, or 5.6% of the gross national product. So because copyright is so important to the United States economy, we have an environment where people are really concerned about making sure that their intellectual property is protected, and that includes publishers and authors alike. So what happens in the world is actually reflected on the campus. And because uh, intellectual property is so important, creators are really worried about being able to protect their own assets. Digital distribution technologies, therefore, constitute both a threat and an opportunity right now. Well, let's, let's first again uh continue to provide people with some background that they may or may not be aware of, and that is that the authors here are also, um, if we can call them this, content consumers. Mm -hmm. And um, there may be some very understandable confusion about how um, strict or loose to play with copyrighted material. And, and there's a term called fair use uh, out there that I think is important to, to bring up and to give people a sense of what that means. And then we're going to take it to the next step, which is to, to ask, well, um, as authors, you know, what are they going to be hoping to achieve in protecting their work? But, but first, what, what does fair use mean uh, on a campus? I want to just back up for one second, because I don't like to assume that everyone understands exactly what can be copyrighted or what copyright is. Fair enough. So uh, a work becomes copyrighted the minute that it is created in a fixed, tangible form of expression. The, the copyright immediately becomes the property of the person who creates it, and only the author or those deriving the rights from the author can claim ownership. So that means when you create your work until it's published and then you have a publisher contract whereby you transfer the rights to the publisher, um, or in some cases the work that you create may in fact be owned by the university if you're a faculty member. Uh, who employs you. So that's an interesting piece of information to be aware of. So the work does not need to be registered with the U.S. Copyright o Office in order to actually be copyrighted, although registration does provide some uh, additional recourse in a court of law in case your work has been infringed. So C Can I just use. ask you then, so, so yes. registration means what exactly? Registration means sending a copy of your manuscript and filling out a form and paying a fee of, I think it's 30 or $35 right now. So it's a, a very simple process. It doesn't mean sending the manuscript to yourself in an envelope so that you have a date stamp uh, that, that tells you that it um, belongs to you. That was one of the myths of copyright for a while. Okay. But you were going to tell us about fair use then. Uh, fair use is a very interesting aspect of copyright law and often is misunderstood. Fair use, in fact, is not a right, which some people think that it is. It is a defense in a court of law. And it's actually in the statute uh, is only about a paragraph. Um, there are four factors to consider when thinking about fair use. And before I go into those, I, I want to mention that this does affect you as academic authors. If you're creating textbooks or uh, chapters or 
scholarly journal articles, your works may be used by other faculty in their classrooms. So it's important for you to be aware of when your works can be used by someone else, distributed to their students, without the ability for you to receive royalty payments or fees for that, for that use, and when, in fact, you're entitled to be able to receive compensation for the use in the classroom. And that's where fair use comes into play. There are four factors, which are the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality, and the market effect. Amount and, subs and market effect are the two factors that really uh, most impact use in an academic environment. There have been copyright uh, guidelines, classroom guidelines, that give faculty a sort of rule of thumb when trying to make a determination about what can be used in a classroom. So a single copy for research or te teaching purposes is permitted uh, without obtaining permission. So someone can make a copy of your material for their own teaching or research purposes. Multiple copies have to meet tests of brevity, spontaneity, spontaneity and cumulative effect. Can, can, Each copy, can, I, can I ask you, because those are sort of loaded terms, if you they would are. Sort of parse them out. Brevity, spontaneity, and cumulative effect. Right. So uh, in brevity, a faculty member can make a photocopy of some of your material, or you can make a photocopy of somebody else's material if it's very brief, uh, if, it, if it isn't the entire work, for example. Spontaneous, we often think of as in a classroom, someone may have come across a piece of material that they want to use and say, wow, this is absolutely relevant to the class that I'm about to uh, have this week and I want to make copies for my students to read or I want my students to access those copies digitally and so I'm just going to make them available in that way and copyright permission is not typically required in that event. Cumulative effect can mean how how often is this going to happen? Is this going to happen semester after semester and is this going to impact the market for the work because after a while the material has been used to such degree that, that it is creating a cumulative amount of material over a long period of time. So um, fair use applies whether it's in an academic environment or in a private or corporate environment. Fair use applies in all cases. But in the classroom, there are some guidelines that make it a little bit more accessible for people to understand. It's, like, fair use is often difficult to determine for an individual. And the thing about online that's so uh, remarkable, I think, is not only can you, you know, get material, but you can find out who's using your material. So I find, even with my own work, that it's occasionally worthwhile to do some searching online, to mm -hmm. Google myself, if you will, to see who may be using material or posting it in certain places. And it's something that I think once an author becomes aware of how easily that's happening, I think they even want to protect it all the more. The, the use of materials in an electronic environment is such a major issue right now. It is perceived often by the institution as a new area of value for intellectual property where creating uh, digital textbooks is also something that um, education publishers are looking at, academic publishers are looking at to have more information about. Um, Students are looking to be able to access their texts online, so course cartridges are available and course textbooks are available electronically. So yes, um, not only are materials created for an online environment, but text materials that don't exist in an electronic format now are being scanned and loaded into an electronic environment and it's very interesting to see if you Google yourself where that might show up either behind a password or simply out there available for the whole world to print and distribute. Right and that, that's going to be a subject that's going to uh, I think uh, uh, Furrow the brows of many people for many years to come, including Google itself. Thank, thank you very much, Drew. You're welcome.